Hey there, drone fans. Welcome to episode one of the Drone Valley podcast. In this initial episode, I'd like to take a minute and welcome you to the family and explain a little bit of what we're hoping to accomplish with the podcast. We really appreciate the viewership we have on YouTube, and a lot of our subscribers have asked us to start this podcast so they could listen to it on the way to work or maybe on the weekends when they have a little bit of spare time. In these podcasts, I'll cover a wide range of emerging technology, including drones, home automation and security systems, mesh Wi-Fi networks, and a ton of other high-tech gear that you're going to want to hear about. We're going to try and make this as interesting as possible and give you all the details you need to clearly understand why a particular technology might be something you want to own. Each podcast will cover a few different technology topics, and there'll be a question of the week at the end. Now, if you have questions you want to ask us, you can send an email to podcast at dronevalley.com. And we'll do our best to gather up all those questions, and on the next podcast, we'll answer as many as we can. The first topic I'd like to discuss in this podcast, since it's timely, is the new FAA interim final rule that was just issued that changes the way you actually label your quad. Now, up until today, when you register your quad, you got a registration number from the FAA, and you could put that number anywhere you wanted on your quad. So a lot of us, like myself, would print out a label, we take the battery out, we put that label inside the battery compartment, snap the battery back in. Now, I didn't do that to hide the number. I did that because I was worried if the label's on the outside of the quad that it would wear over time, I'd have to be changing it, or maybe it would fall off and it wouldn't be on the quad. So having it inside the battery compartment just made sense because the regulation at that point said you can have that label anywhere on your quad as long as someone didn't have to use tools to actually expose it. So inside the battery compartment was a good place to put it. Now this new FAA interim final rule, which is RIN 2120-AL32, in case you want to find out more information about it, you can Google that number. But that new interim final rule changes that to the regulation stating that that number has to be visible outside your quad. Now the reason they're given for that is that there were certain first responders that were worried that if they come upon a quad in a field or on a road, they were worried that if they had to take the thing apart to get at that number, uh, heaven forbid it was some kind of uh, improvised explosive device, they just didn't want to be dealing with it. And also when a quad crashes like that, you've got a LiPo battery in it and LiPos can be fairly sensitive, so maybe the battery's damaged. They just didn't want to mess with it before they actually saw where that FAA number was. Now, for me, I don't know if that's enough of a justification to change the rule, but the honest truth is it's not that big a change, so I didn't find any real problem with it, and I'm more than happy to put my label on the outside of the quad rather than inside the quad. But it seems like we did a clip on the channel this week with it, and there were an awful lot of people that got very upset and very opinionated about the fact that we now had to put the label on the outside of the quad, and I was really confused by that. So I did want to give it a little bit of time here on the podcast to talk through it because from my perspective, you know, I know a lot of people have opposition to it on the basis of, you know, civil liberties and why is the government tracking me and they have no business in my quad flying. But from my perspective, we register a lot of different things. And if you own a boat or if you go, you go out hunting or you go fishing or you own a car or you get married, I mean, you've got to get licenses for all those things or you've got to register that device. And if you are a boater like I am, you're going to put your number on both sides of the front of the boat near the bow. And that's the regulation. So in New Jersey, if I take a boat and I've got a motor on it and I go out in the bay and I don't have those numbers on there, the Marine police can pull me over and issue me a ticket for an unregistered boat. So it's a pretty serious thing. And I don't really mind registering my boat. We've got a couple of dogs. we got dog tags for them that basically, you know, assure people that we've gotten their rabies shots. And if the dog gets lost and somebody finds it and it's got a dog tag on it, they can go to the uh, I guess the animal control people and they can give them the tag number and they can tell them, well, this is Rick's dog and here's where he lives and you can bring him back. So I don't see that as a big deal. And some people push back on the cost of it, but honestly, it's a $5 registration fee. And I should probably talk about that. And there's two ways you can register your quad. So if you're a hobbyist and you're not going to fly commercially, you'll be registering under what's called section 336, which is the old RC flyers, um, you know, hobbyist classification and you'll register your quad as a hobbyist, and that'll cost you $5. You get a single registration number, you can apply that to all of your quads. And it doesn't matter how many you fly, you can apply that same number to all of them. If you decide you want to fly commercially, you have to pass what's called a Part 107 test, and that's a fairly intensive test that asks you a lot of questions about weather conditions and airports and different frequencies for different airports and all kinds of complicated questions about that stuff. I, I feel like, even though I've passed it, I feel like it's a way too complicated test for what we're doing in the drone space, but be that as it may, the FAA put it out. If you pass that, you can fly commercially. 
If you're going to fly commercially, you'll register as a commercial operator under the Part 107, and in that case, you'll pay $5 per quad, and then you get a different number for each of those quads. Now, one other thing that you can do as a commercial operator is if you're going to fly outside the country, there's another classification for sort of an international number, which I think gives you an N number, which is the internationally recognized aircraft number. So if you find you're going to be flying anywhere outside of the United States, uh, you might want to register under that commercial uh, N number system. But either way, it's either going to be a hobbyist or a commercial operator, and it's a $5 registration fee for both for three years' worth of coverage. And again, to me, that's a small price to pay. Now, getting back to the comments, I know a lot of people that are responsible flyers didn't have a problem with it. They've already registered their quads, and it was a really simple matter of moving that label from inside the quad, some compartment to where it's hidden, to outside the quad, and they're done with it, and that's great. But the people that pushed back on it were really upset about a couple of things. Number one, they were worried that if the number's on the outside of the quad, somebody might see that number, copy that number, put it on their quad, and then go off and do nefarious things with their quad. And I'm, I'm giggling a little bit because if you're a bad guy, you're not going to take the time to go find somebody else's number, put it on a label, put it on your quad, and do you know, unsavory things with it. The honest truth is that won't work anyway because if the police come and you've crashed a quad into something, they're going to see the serial number on the quad. They're going to check with the FAA and find out, well, hold on a second, that serial number doesn't match the registration number. So it is a bit of a farce to assume something like that's going to happen. I think more than likely if a bad guy is going to do bad things, they're basically just going to use a quad and do what they're going to do. So I wouldn't worry about that so much. But there was a, a large contingent of conversation around the civil liberties question about the FAA doesn't have the authority to govern this, and what is the government doing in my business? And I'm not a big fan of big government. I'm not. And I know a lot of people take it to extremes. But for me, if there's something like this where there is sort of a sense of danger, right? I'm flying a quad. I'm sharing airspace with commercial flyers. I'm flying over people's properties. I'm flying near public areas, I have no problem with the FAA saying, we want you to register. Because as ridiculous as it sounds, you really are a pilot. You're flying an aircraft, and even though it's a tiny little aircraft, you're sharing airspace with really big aircraft. And the FAA has the responsibility of governing the national airspace, and basically the way they phrase it is from the ground to the heavens. So that lower 400 feet where we're permitted to fly is still under the jurisdiction of the FAA. And if they say, we want to know who's flying, all we're asking is that you register your quads, we're not saying we're going to come looking for you. We're not going to come to your house and grab your quad. They're just asking you to register. I think it's a very simple thing, a very sane thing to do, and I've been a big proponent of supporting that. So if you're listening to the podcast and I'm upsetting you, I apologize. But as a responsible flyer, I feel like we all need to step up and just register the quads. And if you're upset about something, maybe pick a different fight. This is really a small difference in the change in the rule, and it's nothing to worry about. So that's pretty much all I wanted to say about that. But the thing you need to know that's really important is today's uh, February 26th when I'm recording this, 2019, this went into effect on Monday the 25th. So if you're listening to this podcast, this new rule is in effect right now. And I don't know if there's going to be any ramifications if you fly without your registration number on the outside of the quad or you don't register at all. You may get away with it, but heaven forbid you crash the quad or maybe you're out in a beautiful afternoon in a park and you're flying and you're having a great time and a park ranger comes up and asks you to see your registration. You land the quad, there's no registration number on the quad, they have the right to write you a ticket. They probably could confiscate the quad in certain circumstances. So for me, it's just not worth the hassle for the five bucks uh, to not register that quad and just be done with it. So my recommendation to everybody who asks me is register the quad, get a label maker, make a label. And if you don't want to make a label and you feel like you're going to write it on your quad an indelible marker, that's fine too. But just remember when you try to sell it, now you've got a registration number on the quad, you got to get off. But you could write it like I recommend on the propellers. Uh, I wouldn't put a label on the propellers, but if you've got an indelible marker, you could label one or two of the propellers with your number, and that way if you decide later on to trade up your quad or sell your quad, you can just pop on a fresh set of props and you'll be off and running. It'll look like a brand new quad. So that's all I really wanted to say. So if you've listened to this section, again, I hope I didn't get anybody upset, but I, I feel like on the podcast I can be a little bit more open and honest, maybe a little bit more cavalier about our opinions. But for me, it's a no-brainer. It's $5. Register your quad, put the label on the quad, and let's just move on and get back out there and start flying. Our question this episode comes from John M. in Dearborn, Michigan. John sent us an email and asked us the best way of disposing of older lipo cells that will no longer hold a charge. And that's a great question because lipo cells or lithium polymer batteries in general are not only damaging to the environment if you just throw them out with your trash, but they can also be dangerous because the chemistry inside of a lipo battery is a very delicate balance that produces a ton of power 
but they're also very volatile if the chemicals mix. And that can happen if a battery is crushed or pierced or it gets wet. So you want to be very careful about how you dispose of those batteries. And even after they can't hold the charge, those chemicals can still be pretty volatile. So my recommendation is if you have an older LiPo cell that's been damaged or got wet, or if you notice any swelling in the battery at all, you need to take it to a battery recycling center. Most towns have certain places you can bring those on certain days and drop off all of your rechargeable batteries. If not, if you live near a larger big box store like a Home Depot or a Lowe's, they often take lipo cells as well. You can just walk in, go to the courtesy counter and ask them where the recycling box is for the batteries and they'll be happy to take those lipo cells from you. But the last thing you wanna do is just put it in your trash, wheel a can out to the curb and hope for the best because if it ends up in the back of a garbage truck and that battery gets crushed, there's a pretty good chance you could have a lipo fire that uh, combusts because of that battery chemicals mixing. And if you've never seen a lipo fire, take a minute and Google lipo fire and you'll see that that fire is incredibly intense and it'll burn so those chemicals are exhausted and there's very little chance that you can put that kind of fire out. So it's a very, very serious situation. And when you have an older lipo cell, make sure you dispose of it properly. So hopefully that's helpful. Thanks for that question, John, and stay tuned for the next episode. So that's it for episode one. We hope you'll tune into future episodes. We hope you'll subscribe, and we promise to keep things interesting. So thanks again for listening, and until next time, happy flying. <laughs>